Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for bearing with <laughs> what you just witnessed. Um, so technical difficulties. Oh, wow. We tested this three times, by the way, um, between last night and this morning, and it worked fine. So ah, the technology gods are against us. Welcome. And thank you so much for waiting through this uh, period with us. Clearly, we're not getting better with technology as um, time goes on with the pandemic. Um, we are here to talk about Imagine, which is a part of Digital Rights Watch's series on rebalancing the internet economy. It's a project funded by the Internet Society Foundation, who are fantastic. And it's us looking at um, how we uh, want digital platforms to interact um, with, uh, um, with content creators. So this is something we're doing uh, part of, uh, we started this project with Exhibit, which was our first event, and there's gonna be a couple of more. So if you're interested, uh, we have fantastic um, speakers lined up for all of them, this one included. Um, you're very welcome to do that and join us. Um, today, we are joined in Venueless with my colleague, Sam, who I believe um, was already um, uh, shepherding people through <laughs> this technical difficulty that we've had. Um, Sam and Lily, who you saw uh, come out here with me from the backstage, are um, going to keep an eye on things. So we do request that we keep this space um, sort of um, warm and welcoming. Um, we have a very low tolerance for hate and, um, and sort of discriminatory speech. So there's a code of conduct um, and they will be um, they will be enforcing it. So if you make crappy comments, you're going to get booted. Um, that's that. Um, before we launch into uh, the event, and we're already behind, so I'm conscious of time, um, and the fireside that we're going to kick off with, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm, I'm currently in Europe, but a lot of the people um, attending today are coming from uh, different unceded lands. Um, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'd normally be um, working from, which is the Bunurung Bun Wurrung and the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation in Melbourne, in today's Melbourne. Um, at Digital Rights Watch, we acknowledge that many of the systems of surveillance that we deal with have roots in Australia's history of colonization. Um, and we must keep that in mind um, because especially uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folks um, keep kind of being subject to disproportionate surveillance and policing. And I think we all have a role in understanding um, how those systems interplay with the world around us and decolonizing and questioning them uh, the best we can. Um, we also do try to acknowledge that Indigenous communities build rich systems of governance, justice, and knowledge sharing um, over thousands of years, which do not rely on pervasive surveillance. Um, so we love to learn um, from indigenous knowledge and we like to build our communities um, around the knowledge that they are willing to share with us. So that's that's my digital rights um, acknowledgement um, of country, I guess. Um, we are kicking off this event with um, a fireside chat today um, with Rebecca Gablin, who is, I want to say, a longtime friend of the pod because <laughs> I've listened to Pod Save the World too much. Um, but uh, Rebecca Goblin is ARC Future Fellow at Melbourne Law School. Um, she leads interdisciplinary teams to build evidence about how intellectual property arrangements and other regulations actually work in practice. And um, I will ask Lily to make Rebecca appear on stage with me because that is the magic of technology. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Lucy. Um, and I guess the wonderful thing that I will say is that Rebecca is right now working, well, you have finished work on a book called The Shakedown, which you co-wrote with, uh, co-authored with Corey Doctoroff, and which will be released by Beacon Press in 2022. So I thought let's start this, let's start this from the back. Can you tell us, well, welcome, <laughs> tell us what is The Shakedown? What are you shaking now? Uh, well, this this project, um, it actually, it was, it started in a taxi. Corey and I were sharing a taxi back to Melbourne City a few years ago. He was in town for a book tour. 
Um, we were also doing an event together on creators' rights at the Wheeler Center. And when we were in the taxi, we were talking about, you know, when, when people talk about um, copyright law and there is this whole discourse about creators and platforms, um, it often gets framed as being about creators versus users. And what was really frustrating us about that framing is that it elides the fact that no matter which side of this divide that um, which I would say is a false dichotomy, but which side of that false dichotomy somebody's on, they're going to be just as abusive um, as anyone on the other as long as they've got the power to do so. And so, the, you know, what we were concerned about is that we creators are given this choice between big tech and big content um, as if that's the only choice that's available to them um, and, you know, asked to just accept a few crumbs from the table. And we wanted to get into um, talking about why that was not good enough and all of the things that we could do to actually take some power back for creators um, separate to that. And look, I think, you know, possibly some people who are tuned in tonight don't know exactly how bad things have got for creators. So let me just maybe run you through a few things. Um, book advances have halved since the GFC uh, in Australia. Uh, increasingly, people are not getting um, any kind of advance at all from their publisher, partly because of how much publishers are being shaken down by Amazon. Um, songwriters are getting, you know, royalty statements are about four times as thick with a quarter of the money. Um, Fiona Bevan wrote Unstoppable, uh, number one, um, a part of the Kylie Minogue's recent number one album. Um, she made about £100 in um in streaming revenues from that hit song um co-written co with kylie um it's and news publishers as well i think a lot of us really have that on our radar they used to get almost you know 100 cents of every dollar that was spent on ads now in some cases it's as low as 30 cents in the dollar um and so there's agreement that all of this is terrible, but what the disagreement is about is what the causes of it are. And what Corey and I have been arguing is that it really comes down to excessive corporate concentration, whether it's by the record labels and the music publishers, or whether it is by YouTube and Amazon. Um, and this is contributing to terrible outcomes for creators. And I think, you know, the other thing that I would say is, you know, when we're thinking about the underlying causes um, of these terrible outcomes. Um, I mean, the reason why creative workers are receiving a declining share of the revenues from their work is the same reason that all workers are, which is basically that we've structured society to make rich people richer at the expense of everybody else. Okay, well, we are now starting a revolution at the <laughs> Digital Rights Watch web stream again. Um, yeah, sorry, I was, so vigorously jotting down notes um, that I forgot to unmute just now. But uh, I, I find that really fascinating because it is something that I grapple with when I see the record profits of these industries. Um, and I think the tech sector specifically is like touted, um, you know, as, as just ever growing and sort of infinite in valuation and, and profits. And I think we look at Amazon, but even Spotify, like billions, um, you know, made how how do we reckon I, I have such a hard time reconciling than my friends telling me that they're getting paid cents per dollar you know yeah. um for a song absolutely like the entire internet economy runs on creative labor you know, information and culture are the edifice on which big tech is built and on which it's powered that's what ads are sold around that's what people pay to access the big platforms are making billions and billions of dollars, and so are their investors um, off the back of creative workers. And so what's the what's the traditional like user versus creator dynamic? Is that like people pirating content? So the blame is like shifted on individuals that they're not willing to pay for it. They're, is, is that the dichotomy that? Yeah, so um, so the, the users, um, creators versus users dichotomy, what you end up with is um, creators includes all kinds of rights holders and cultural investors, so record labels and music publishers and book publishers, um, 
And then on the user side of the equation, um, you've got individuals, yes, um, but you've also got uh, libraries and cultural institutions um, and universities and schools and so on. And that tends to be um, how the debate has been centered, um, particularly over the last um, 20 years during the, the digital era. But of course, it's much more complicated than that because um, we've got different reasons, um, you know, and, and, and a different sort of public policy um, motivations for different kinds of use. Um, and they also have different kinds of effect on the market for works. Um, but also lumping um, creators together with major rights holders really elides the power dynamics here. And the fact that we do see a lot of abuse, um, particularly, um, I, I think the, the record industry is the textbook example of this. The record industry has less power now than it has ever had because of digital technologies. Now, the shift to digital was incredibly difficult and painful and people hemorrhaged money. Um, and we're only just starting to see that being made up now with the advent of streaming. However, what's different now is that creators do have an alternative to the major record labels and that has forced them to actually change their ways. Uh, before, the kinds of contracts that were offered, um, the um, problems around payments, um, the fact that uh, it was very, very difficult to audit your label, but when people did, the errors were almost always found in one direction um, against creators. The um, in incredible practices like um, charging uh, artists for breakage, um, you know, which is a holdover from those very fragile original records um, made of shellac, uh, but actually ended up getting charged on downloads. It's pretty hard to break a digital download. Um, like all of these practices have gradually been reformed because there is more choice. But that industry and that experience demonstrates that we, even if you're a creator, um, just uh, looking at the other organizations that are on the creator side of the ledger, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're on your side. What we're saying in this book is that nobody's necessarily on your side um, because corporations are there uh, to make as much money as possible for their shareholders. That's how we happen to have arranged society at the moment. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to recognize that big business of all kinds is capturing the lion's share of the value of culture. And we need to think really broadly about the different things that we can do to take that back. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's oh, sorry, can you mute just sorry, when I'm speaking? Because I'm, I'm speaking, getting a bit, of I'm feedback. getting a bit of feedback. Yeah. Um, I find that fascinating because I, I grapple with that. Um, that um, so much um, in, in in thinking through this work um, and how um, basically you know I mean I fight for a free and open internet that's kind of my my, my life's work at this point um, and I think the internet is so often touted as like a, an avenue of success especially for the creative arts because you can reach audiences in ways that perhaps you wouldn't have been able to before you can reach the global audience um, but actually I'm uh, you know, it, in doing this project, I'm thinking a lot more about the artist's connection to their local community um, and how that's actually sometimes more important. And I don't think digital platforms do a fantastic job. Um, and I, I guess that's the kind of theme of this project. I'm not sure they do a fantastic job at um, taking into consideration the local context. Um, and so is is the internet, that's maybe an existential question, but is that is the free and open internet still there for artists? Is it or is it subject to too many algorithms and and too much sort of abuse and that that centralization that you described? You know, because you really, if you don't exist on certain platforms, it's like you 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 don't exist. Yeah, I mean, and there's a there's a reason for that. Like, there's a reason why you need to be on YouTube, even though the rates that YouTube offers are incredibly bad. And the reason why you need to be on Spotify, even though it's exactly the same thing. Like these companies, it's no accident that they're so powerful, right? They set out to lock in creators and cultural producers, and then to make their markets as hostile as possible to any new entrants, and then use the resulting lack of choice um, to force 
people to accept less for their work than what they would get in any reasonably competitive market. Um, and they do this in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, Amazon, for example, um, it, you know, it's got such a lock over um, ebooks and audiobooks. One of the, way, the reasons why it's been able to do that is by using digital rights management, um, which is, uh, you know, um, directly opposed to free and open internet. They use that on the books, not to protect copyright, but because then people cannot move their libraries over to another service. It keeps them locked into the Amazon ecosystem. Um, uh, we see as well a uh, Spotify. Uh, it, it, you know, um, if you use Spotify, you might have noticed how much it encourages you to access playlists um, and to sort of outsource to Spotify the decision about what you're going to hear in your ears. Um, the reason that they do that is because the more that they can decide what you listen to, the more power they have over artists. Um, and they're exercising that. You know, already we're seeing. Um, Spotify go to artists and say, well, um, if you like, we can um, prioritize you for playlisting and you'll get heard more, um, but you need to accept a massive discount on the royalties if you do that. And so they're, they're exercising their power that they've, they've developed through making sure there's no other choice in order to shake down creators more and more. And you know, then thinking about well, what we can, what what can we do about it? And I'm going to come back to your point about local shortly. There's all kinds of things that we can do. Um, you know, if we're concerned about uh, DRM and uh, the way that that um, that locks in creators, and oh, can I just tell you very quickly? I want to tell you just a, a story to just demonstrate how bad this has got. Um, Amazon, for example, has made sure that Audible. Uh, is almost the only choice for buying audiobooks. Um, and uh, if you're a subscriber, you might have noticed it's got this incredibly generous returns policy where you can hand um, you can return a book up to 365 days after you listen to it, even if you listen to the whole thing and even if you really enjoyed it, and that's great. Um, what you might not realise is that until very recently, Amazon was clawing back those um, returns directly from the independent authors who were selling their books on, um, on Audible. And they were hiding this. So in their reporting, they would report the number of net sales. And so it might be that uh, an author saw that they had three sales for that day. And what that's missing is that actually they had 10 sales for that day, but they had seven returns from other days, which were just uh, mysteriously um, uh, not mentioned. Um, and the only reason that anybody found out that this was going on, or that there were suspicions, um, but there was a glitch in the system. And one day, three weeks of returns all got processed in the same day. And suddenly everybody could get an idea of what was going on. And there's this amazing writer called Susan May, um, who's Australian based in Perth. And she's been leading a campaign ever since to get Amazon to change its ways. So one of the things that's really important um, as a, a, a tactic for allowing creators to take back some power against these really extractive platforms is transparency. It's absolutely critical, whether we're talking about um, Amazon and those returns or whether we're talking about Spotify and the rates that it actually pays out to people, um, YouTube and the amount of streams that are actually happening, um, Hollywood talent agencies and um, how much they're earning in packaging fees. Transparency on all of these things allows us to, once we know what's going on, we have much better chance of doing something about it and particularly organizing to doing to do something about it. And that's the power of collective action. Um, we could also see the power of, of collective ownership, um, cooperative um, ownership of, uh, for example, ebook stores, or in the case of news platforms, um, uh, news organizations, ad platforms, in order to be able um, to work together to move out of the Google and Facebook ad ecosystem and uh, create a cooperatively owned one um, by news organizations working together. For addressing the problems of DRM, we need radical interoperability. Um, we need to be able to 
um, for example, strip DRM from books so that your library can be migrated to another app. And that would facilitate things like a cooperatively owned bookstore um, owned by authors uh, that are then get a greater share of the price of their eBooks. It would also really help um, with these lock-ins that Apple and Google have um, over all kinds of content where they're charging a 30% VIG um, just for being the one, the gatekeeper that sits between um, the mobile phone and the, the content that's needed. Um, and coming back again, like I, I promised to do, to um, that localness. There's so many things, as you point out, Lucy, that the big platforms just can't do. They're terrible at showcasing, for example, music and other content from local creators. Um, and there's some really exciting initiatives uh, that are, uh, are running around the world. Things like having local public libraries offer digital streaming services for local musicians. And what's exciting about this is not just that uh, they their royalties tend to be better than the ones that Spotify pay, but that because um, they're attracting local audiences to local acts or uh, that, that they're much more likely to translate into people actually going to gigs when that's a thing again, and buying merchandise and actually getting involved in a meaningful way in the kind of involvement that actually results in dollars in the in in in, uh, in, in people's pockets. So there's just a huge amount of things that we we can do um, once we start recognizing that the problem is that um, there are these choke points that enormous corporations are able to create. Um, whether it's a big record label, a big music publisher, or YouTube or Amazon or any of the platforms, um, and that what we need to be working towards together is widening out those choke points so that people have meaningful choices um, and different options available to them other than the, the major ones um, that we've been talking about today. Yeah, I think about choke points a lot because I think... A few years ago, when I think to myself a few years ago, I was so excited about some of these digital ecosystems because as someone who travels and I've been displaced through the nature of my parents' work my entire life, I was just so excited to be able to like take these things on the road with me and, and you know, be able to access the same things from everywhere, basically. Uh, but I'm increasingly just more excited about libraries and radios um, and, and, you know, these sort of like localized infrastructures. Um, and I... I I find it a more enriching experience actually to um, to seek them out and, and, you know, actually participate in that sort of uh, community. Um, I am so frustrated <laughs> with DRNs right now <laughs> because I downloaded some books uh, for my flight and I have a reader um, that's called Remarkable. It's called The Remarkable. And uh, I downloaded books on the, I think the Google bookstore or whatever. And I just thought, oh, cool. And I'll be able to share the PDF or whatnot with my Remarkable and read it. And I was not able to do that. <laughs> and that was infuriating. Um, so I, I felt the pain of that. But I guess um, that, is, that is by design, Lucy. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see what's happened with DRM. So uh, very few lessons have been learned over the years. But you know, Apple started um, Apple started its store um, for MP3s uh, with DRM. That allowed it to take an enormous share um, of the market and to um, extract really high fees and to discourage alternatives. Uh, but then, when the Amazon ebook store started up, the publishing industry hadn't learned anything from that. Um, you know. In order to break away from Apple's power, the record labels were forced to provide their MP3s to other stores without any DRM. But nonetheless, the publishers insisted on Amazon using DRM and ended up in exactly the same boat. Um, and we see for audiobooks, at least, that Google has started um, a DRM-free audiobook site, which is directly attempting to respond to the, the power of Audible over um, audiobooks. But it's making very few inroads because everybody is so locked in. You know, audiobook consumers, it's a really developed market now. Everybody's locked in. They want to be able to access their library of books. Um, and they're just not going to be able to if they switch somewhere else. So this is just a story that keeps happening over and over and over again. And it's time that we really learn from it that interoperability 
um, preventing lock-ins to one specific platform, enabling choice. That's what we need for a healthy creative ecosystem. Amen. <laughs> um, but I guess one of the things that struck me um, is when we were talking about sort of the the, the rev revenues and royalties that people are getting in that in the course of working on the shakedown, did you guys come across like labor law and how this interacts with some of that at the local? Because I'm I'm just thinking what sort of rights uh, you know do people have in dealing with these platforms? Is that is that the place? Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the places that's really interesting. Um, we have um, minimum wages for other kinds of work, but we don't have um, minimum wages for creative labor. And one of the ideas that we talk about is the possibility of using compulsory licenses um, in a little bit more of a radical way um, to act as a floor for the amount that um, platforms are able to pay for specific kinds of work. So um, in music, for example, we've long had compulsory licenses over the song rights, so actually the composition rights, the um, the lyrics and the music, um, but not over the recording itself. Um, so that's the sound recording. So that's handled by the record label instead of the music publisher. Sorry, um, music licensing is so incredibly complex and simultaneously dull. Um, so I apologize for ha having to explain anything about it. Um, it's awful. So mind numbingly complex and dull that sometimes writing the book, we wanted to just gnaw our arms off, but um, here we are. Um, now the, um, the problems with, there's been lots of problems with um, compulsory licenses over music over the years, but particularly where it acts as a, a, a ceiling, like a, a maximum payment instead of a floor as a minimum payment. We would like to see us use them a little bit differently to create a floor so that even if YouTube has a lot of power to negotiate, um, they're not able to negotiate below a certain minimum in a similar to, way to how minimum wages um, work for other kinds of jobs. So that's certainly one thing that we could do um, to subvert um, the the um, over large negotiating power of the the big platforms. Yeah, I find that really fascinating because when I speak to and and actually for anyone who's really interested in this Spotify situation, we are going to be running an event specifically about musicians in this series. So if this is like if this has made you furious. <laughs> in some way, um, please join us. We'll be talking to some people from radios and we'll be talking to some people who are making literal sense from hundreds of thousands of plays on Spotify. Um, yeah, I guess that's just something I struggle with when people tell me, like some friends of mine, how much they've made when they were played on the radio versus how much they make from, you know, such a big, much bigger reach on Spotify. I'm furious and I also feel helpless as like, not helpless, helpless, but I, I feel helpless as like the end user because I pay Spotify and I pay YouTube. So I think, I, I think when I set up those services and I started paying for them, I thought I, I was excited because I thought, okay, well now I'm, I don't have to look at the ads, but like the content creator is getting paid. And so it almost, um, I'm wondering if that's like a false thing that they set up in your head as the end user to like make you more okay with the extractive nature of these services and sort of like bamboozle me into comfort <laughs> that I'm paying, but no one's actually getting, the people I want paid are getting paid. Yeah, and look, that's, this is, I mean, it's scandalous, but it's really important to understand how this came about. Um, when Spotify set up, it needed permission from the major labels to get access to their catalogs. The major record labels control um, over two thirds of the world's recorded music. And they have that locked up for an incredibly long time because all of their contracts are for the entire term of copyright. So even music um, from the 50s, 60s, 70s is well uh, captured by these companies and controlled by them. And so there was no way to actually create a streaming industry without permission from the majors. And so the majors shaped the form of the streaming industry, and they did that to benefit themselves. Um, it doesn't have to work the way that it works. One of the changes that could be made, um, okay, so the way that royalties are paid out at the moment, all of our Spotify subscription fees get put into a big pool, 
and then apportioned out according to how many streams um, were played by how many, um, by particular artists, right? Um, and that means that the music that gets listened to a lot on repeat um, is the music that um, tends to get uh, the biggest share of the pot. Now, an alternative way would be to do something called user-centric payments, um, which would mean, okay, so I pay my $15 a month and I only listen to the cellist Zoe Keating. And so of the... Um, 70% uh, or so of that $15 a month that's available to be paid out in royalties, all of my, my money would go to Zoe Keating. Even if I only listened to her a few times that month, she would just get all of that amount. Now, there is very good reason to believe that if we allocated the money that way, then it would really benefit independent artists um, and more challenging music uh, because the people who listen to more challenging music are probably not running it, um, you know, 12 hours a day because it, it is um, a little bit harder to listen to. Um, the reason why we don't know this for sure is because the, the major record labels stop um, companies like Deezer who want to try user-centric streaming uh, models from actually implementing them. Uh, and they do that because they think that that's going to be furthering their financial interests. And so when we think about why, why um, outcomes are so bad from streaming, we need to understand that, yes, Spotify contributes to this, but we also need to understand that giving these handful of companies so much power, just because they were powerful in the past, these long copyright contracts give them power to control the future of music as well in a way that's really unhealthy and that prevents creators from taking full advantage of um, the exploitation opportunities that have been created by digital technologies and the internet. Um, and one of the responses to that um, is rights reversion. You know, we should not be allowing um, companies to take rights for a century or more unless they're really paying for them, um, unless those are fair bargains, um, unless creators have genuine alternatives. And um, rights reversion, um, that's where, for example, creators can reclaim their copyrights after 35 years in the United States, um, after 25 years after they die in Canada, um, and there's various other formulations uh, elsewhere in the world. That's a really good start, but we need to be talking about um, reverting rights sooner than that. And all of the economic analysis suggests that um, investors will make the same decisions and pay the same amount out um, in advances and royalties if they get rights for just 25 years um, rather than 100 years. And if we had rights um, transfers be cancelable by creators after 25 years, unless the record company wants to renegotiate um, or, you know, um, or unless they can't find a better deal somewhere else, then we would see that the um, the majors would have much less control over the the future of music, and we would see that the creator share would increase. Yeah, I do realize that we've like veered off to talk a little lot about music when this is really about writers, but this is the same sort of principle, right? With like with sort of books and the interaction that they have with some of these services. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I can talk about books forever. Um, we've just, we're just we uh, just about to launch a really exciting new project called Untapped, which is at untapped.org.au. Um, this is uh, uh, an experiment that we're doing in conjunction with libraries and authors uh, from around Australia to figure out what is the value of reversion rights. Um, and it's, it's based in Australia's book industry. Um, most of Australia's literary heritage is out of print and simply unavailable for anybody to access. Um, and that includes, you know, books by incredible Australian writers like um, um, Colin Tealy and um, uh, Gail Jones and um, uh, Kamal Bird and Anita Heiss and so many others that I'm, I'm really excited to say that we've, we've managed to... Uh, They've reverted their rights to their out-of-print books. They've licensed them to us, and we are making we're digitizing those books, making them available for sale as eBooks and also um, for um, for loan from libraries. And we're going to actually be measuring what is the economic value of reversion rights and figuring out 
the kind of financial and cultural costs of allowing rights to stay in the hands of um, investors that are not particularly interested in them anymore. So stay tuned for the outcomes from that. That is amazing. Um, and that's untapped.org.au is where that's going to live. That's right. Yeah. And everybody definitely should be uh, checking that out and borrowing these books from their libraries or buying copies. There's some really amazing stuff in there. I love that. I love that we were able to, to bring that back. Um, I am conscious of time because we started this event super duper late. Um, I think we kind of covered all of the like little things I wanted to dig in with you. Um, I am thinking a lot about the, you know, you've already made so many suggestions about about how to like sort of rebalance that, you know, uh, but is there anything else you wanted to add? I guess, thank you so much for joining this chat, but is there anything else you wanted to end on in terms of what digital platforms can and should be doing or what as users maybe, like the people who have joined us on the stream and who will watch this later um, um, can be doing in this environment, like take back all that power and we'll end on that powerful note. <laughs> Look, I think the main thing that I wanna add to the million things that I've said already, and thanks uh, everybody for um, uh, for hearing this out, is look the, the the fight for creative workers is the fight for all workers. Um, choke point capitalism is not at all unique to the culture industries. It's everywhere. You know, every company um, is trying to get the power to. Um, close off alternatives so that they can extract a bigger and bigger share of um, the value of our labor. And they're winning, right? Um, labor's share uh, versus capital share has been in decline for decades now, and there's no sign that that's going to be turning around. And I just really think that there is enormous potential for collective action uh, to be successful here. We're, start, we're seeing it in small ways. We see Susan May's campaign against Amazon with um, the, the audible travesty. Um, we see it in what the Writers Guild of America managed to pull off um, against the, the um, big four Hollywood talent agencies that were squeezing them. Um, they have managed to get all of those agencies to back down and move to a very different business model and, and give writers back their power. Um, I just, I see huge potential here for us to recognize this as a joint fight and to come together in solidarity um, to uh, not only improve the worker, the lot of creative workers, but, you know, um, stop these choke points for all the rest of us as well. Well, I love that. I love the message of it. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if you had, if, if you specifically head to the Venueless um, stream now to, to the interface that we're using, there's a question for you. And I think just for the sake of time, I have to let you take it in chat, but I think that's an interesting one. So um, thanks everyone. And you are, so Rebecca, thank you for joining us. We'll give a little, give us little hearts and stuff in Venueless. <laughs> and um, and yeah, you can hop in there and thanks so much. And um, Lily, I'll ask you to take her back to the green room. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, um, when you were all waiting for us, uh, we did ask you um, to write what uh, country you're joining us from. So thank you for everyone who's done that. I um, encourage it. And then if you have questions that you wanna ask us, um, you can drop those in the chat and um, the Digital Rights Watch sneaky team of chat ninjas <laughs> will get it through to me. So um, I I mean, there are some things that we are just gonna talk through, but if there are questions that pop up in your mind, feel free. And I have sent Rebecca to you, so you can chat with her in the in the comments. Okie dokes. Um, that aside, we are gonna launch into this panel discussion and I'm so excited. Um, Lily, give me a second before you bring everyone out of the green room. Um, I'm so excited to be bringing this to you guys. Um, it's just, um, Sam and I have loved really putting these um, events together because we kind of get to bring out people that we have encountered who have in one way or another um, inspired or shaped our thinking. Um, throughout this project and, and throughout our own lives. So this is, um, that that's what we try to bring in. Anyway, I'm gonna be joined by three amazing people. 
I'm going to introduce them and then Lily, I'll ask you to bring them on just so they're not, they don't have to awkwardly sit there and look at everyone while I say who they are. Um, so we're joined by Rosalyn, um, who is a multidisciplinary artist working across live performance, video, text, um, and experimental music. Her work explores the ways in which new technologies produce language, communication, and meaning. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Kimberly, who is an amazing filmmaker whose drive is to tell stories that are truthful, impactful, and celebrate the strength and resilience of First Nations people. I can't think of anything more important in today's day and age. And the last person who's joining us is Patrick, who is a freelance journalist and author and was the deputy arts and culture editor at The Conversation and the former editor of Junkie. So with that, can I have them up on the stage with me? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, and thank you guys for hanging out in the backstage for way too long because this just took us a little bit of time. <laughs> to get through. It's an absolute pleasure and a treat um, to be joined by you tonight. Um, I don't know if you, I did sort of a generic intro at the beginning, but if you, before you speak, if you want to do an acknowledgement of where you are um, tuning in from, um, you are super welcome to do that. Um, but otherwise, I'll just hop in and you can just kind of do it as a part of your first, first answer. Um, I'm keen, I'm, I'm just gonna get stuck in because we are so behind time, but <laughs> Patrick, um, you worked at Junkie, now you've written a book. Um, when we thought about, you know, who to invite for this um, and, and to look at with us, you know, what writers and how they interact with digital platforms, you immediately came to our minds um, because we think you have a really fun <laughs> social media presence. Um, how do you perceive your sort of work and and what's sort of the good stuff about what you do and digital platforms. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm uh, joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and uh, pay my respects to them. Um, yeah, uh, I think that uh, the internet has played such a pivotal role with my career as both a journalist and a writer that it's actually very hard to separate them. I, it's uh, it's almost at the stage where I can think of a handful of situations which uh, have kind of progressed my career off the internet. Uh, you know, from the from the very beginning, it was connections that I made online that kind of like shaped where I went. In like uh, like a million years ago, when um, Junkie first got created. Uh, Steph Harmon was hired to be the, the first editor and she was thinking of people who she wanted to write for it. And I had a blog that I wrote for free uh, called The Spontaneity Review where I would get drunk and rate things uh, that I saw around me, um, you know, such as like anything from the sun itself to like, you know, um, you know, music concerts or something like that. And she liked that for some bizarre reason and said, do you want to write uh, for me for money? And I was like, that's such a ridiculous question, but yes, you know, um, and I had no idea. I'd never thought of being a journalist or anything. I never thought that I had a, like any kind of uh, future writing for like online platforms. And I had no idea that it even like existed as a possibility. So yeah, there's, and it's always been like that. I've always had my next career step kind of uh, informed for me from, um, from online communities. And it's also how, when I became editor of Junkie, it's how I tended to find most of the new writers who I was, um, who I would bring into the fold and, you know, start off in, in their journalism careers. I would usually see someone uh, often, often someone who, would be outside of those kind of um, very gate kept fields like journalism degrees and things. And I just see them writing something absolutely uh, bonkers, but amazing on Twitter. And I'd say, like, I'd reach out to them and be like, do you want to, do you want to write for me? So that's, that's, uh, that's really my kind of, uh, my experience sort of summed up, I think, just odd serendipitous opportunities created from the, uh, the chaotic formless void that is uh that is social community uh social um, media communities 
I, I love that because you're in essence, in a way, like the, the sort of success story that plot, like digital platforms want to um, want to present to the world. And I, gosh, I so want to just dig into like some of the issues that come up from that, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, but how do you, I'm just curious, how do you view the different platforms you're on? Because you have a bit of a, like, do they serve different purposes in your life? You have Instagram, you have Twitter. Um, is when you, specifically like when you were writing the book, did you think a lot about your presence across them and, and how you, how it would um, help you to, cro you don't have to give us like all the dirty details, but how did it play into your thinking? Yeah, I mean, like I've got a, um, you know, I, I've got a stinky background in digital marketing uh, for books. So, um, so when I was writing my uh, when I was writing my latest book, I really was thinking, looking at my social media and thinking of myself in the way that I used to think of my authors uh, and be like, well, you know, how many how many people do you have on this platform? How many people do you have on this platform? How can you best reach them? How can you reach them in a way that is authentic and engaging? You know, um, I would, I never really thought of myself as like swindling someone because, uh, you know, but like in the end no one's going to buy something they don't actually want you know which is kind of the lie that marketers tell themselves to you know get uh, help them fall asleep at night i think um so uh yeah i i i um i did think of my social media platforms in a very different way while that book was um sort of being written and being uh promoted i you know i did think of them as something that would be was a bit more curated i guess um but then that's like i work that kind of divide all the time because i'll you know i'll i'll use social media as a way of you know uh engaging with my friends and my community having fun mostly i i just spend a lot of time you know like using it as a fun way to blow off steam but i also use it every day for my work as a journalist and you know use it to promote books and stuff so like it is a weird sort of blend that I don't think is always an intuitive mixture um but something that uh I think through many life mistakes have has meant that I've like grown very accustomed to <laughs> yeah I really we're gonna get to like some of the negatives of that because I use social media as a part of my work every day too and there are mm. some pitfalls <laughs> Um, yeah, but I, I'm going to just hop across to, to Rosalind now. Um, and I think you, just based on um, when I finally got to your webpage, based on reading everything there, um, I, I think you look at things from like a much more critical, not like negatively critical, but from much more of an observational perspective. And I'm just curious, like, do you see uh, digital platforms like is it still a place where people can get and reach new audiences? Um, is it still, you know, specifically in your areas, is it still that sort of place that Patrick just described, you know, where uh, you can kind of leap and bound from opportunity to opportunity, or does that exist only in specific, very specific sets of circumstances? Um, oops. You're breaking up a little bit, but I think I caught the gist of your question. Um, just, was, can you just repeat, paraphrase it? For me again sorry uh yeah do you <laughs> do you in your work do you see it similarly to patrick or it has do you see more you know yeah so is, is it still that space yeah so um so my work as an artist uh is coming from a um a more critical not in the negative sense necessarily but in in the kind of sense of trying to build awareness about how digital platforms and technologies are shaping the way that we um, think and act and communicate and, and exist in the world. Um, so a number of projects that I've done have kind of directly engaged with digital platforms. Uh, an early project that I did was as simple as organizing a, a Facebook chat group with um, some with friends that Facebook suggested to me to join a group, a kind of automated uh, development of a group of people and we we would meet once a week online to just talk and to try and uh over that time become aware of what the patterns of speech were in our conversations what we were able to do what we weren't able to do and to kind of build um an awareness around 
what that was enabling, but also what that was uh, blocking us from from being able to do as a kind of ad hoc um, group of people, not all of whom knew each other. And there were some really amazing things that came out of that project. Um, new friendships emerged, people met up in real life um, and are still friends today. Um, but also I think it gave us an awareness of the primarily Facebook, and this is probably five or six years ago, but um, it ties in nicely with some of like the news media um, conversations that are happening now um, around and around the flattening of information and the algorithms and the hierarchies of that information that was being presented to us and finding ourselves talking uh, about you know, kind of current political issues, really important stuff at the same time as, you know, how to cook a lasagna or, you know, where you walk your dog. And that seems like a very banal observation on the surface of it. But I think when you drill down, it really illuminates the way, the different ways in which we're orientating ourselves in the world because of social media and, and what is being preferenced in our daily lives and what is maybe sinking to the bottom. So I've done a few other projects that look at that look at other platforms like Instagram and um, online chat on um, commercial websites that are trying to sell you things and trying to engage with people off script and to, to try and push those boundaries and see what happens in a kind of really commercial uh, interaction online. So that's the kind of scope of my work. Um, and I try not to be too didactic about it. I think that's a very complex space. Um, in 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 trying to understand what it what the internet and what these mega platforms are enabling us to do as well as prohibiting us from doing so yeah hopefully that answers your question I think it does and then some um, and I'm gonna just I hope my connection is okay I'm gonna try and speak slowly um, I did realize that I was also streaming this event in another tab so I've now closed that oh, running online events it's gonna kill me um, <laughs> Kimberly, if I can come to you, um, and I didn't do your acknowledgement justice at all, so please feel free um, to, to do that. Um, but I'm curious to hear your own view of your online presence, because you were actually the hardest person to find and track down. Um, <laughs> but you do have Twitter, and so I'm just wondering, could you walk us how you view uh, sort of your the interaction of your work and, and the digital spaces around us? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just introduce myself by saying that I'm a proud Yaru Bardi and Gija woman from Broome, Western Australia. So I'm feeling, um, I always feel really far away from my country. I'm um, in Nam, in Wurundjeri country, Bunurong country, the Kulin Nation. So um, I've been here for a few years and, and yeah, really um, pay respect to the ancestors who have looked after me while I've been here and um, the elders and community that I've formed relationships with since being here. I feel really lucky. But, um, yeah, that's, um, that's funny that you found my Twitter because um, I feel like whenever I get a follow on Twitter or something, I'm like, guys, don't follow me. <laughs> I don't have anything to post, <laughs> but um, but it, yeah, I, I have I've had a bit of a um, I suppose like a strange relationship with social media over the years, but I wanted to like I think it's it's really complicated and like it's really interesting to hear both Patrick and Rosalind, Rebecca, um, you guys are all amazing thinkers in this space, and um, I often just think about. Um, how I interact with the platforms with my relationship to country and like to me country um, whether that's my like ancestral country in Broome, um, Yaru country or whether I'm here on Wurundjeri country so I'm always sort of um, thinking about how I um, yeah and like I as a filmmaker I'm constantly thinking of stories like story I every day I'm interacting with stories um, like how do I tell stories, what stories to tell, um, who's going to listen to them. But at the, that, but uh, yeah, I feel a great sense of responsibility in that space, um, to, to my community. And, um, I, I suppose bringing it back to my online presence, like I, um, I feel lucky in the sense that I've had, most of my professional career um, and projects I've worked on have been through just relationships with people and people um, 
introducing me to other people, you know, catching up and jumping on projects. And I haven't felt a need to put myself um, and my projects onto social media platforms or I don't have a website or I feel really, um, makes me really nervous. <laughs> and and I, like, I have such um, admiration and I'm like in awe of people like Patrick who like, you're, you know, Twitter famous and, you know, other people who have amazing presence online. I like, I'm, I'm on this, you know, scrolling Twitter and um, I still have, I still have a Facebook page. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so it's yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure where I was ending with that point, but I I really love that. Yes, Patrick is with us here because he's Twitter famous. That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> his value to this conversation. I joke. Um, I, yeah, I I find that really fascinating because I think specifically, um, like having worked in the international space with a lot of these companies, they specifically try to say. Um, that indigenous communities and and sort of you know minority groups get uplifted um through the use of digital platforms and i'm just i'm actually having worked in australia now for a couple of years i'm actually not sure that's that's true at all it seems um you know that people are perfectly capable and wonderfully existing um on their outskirts and that seems like your experience too so yeah but in saying that like the you know digital platforms have um been such a ground, you know, you know, groundbreaking space for people to share and, and for access. Like, um, you know, like the, the films that I make are mainly um, have been broadcast on TV um, and lots of people don't have TVs now. You know, we all just watch through our laptops and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to find households that have an antenna TV. So, yeah, like to you know, and and for me to to for me to share my the the work that I do, um, like I have to sh I have to, you know, I feel a sense you know of, um, yeah, like pride and also um, just thankful that there's online services and and places for my family and my community to watch the work that I produce and um, and interact with it because at the end of the day that's what's the most important. So. Yeah, and I feel also I'm like I'm I'm quite privileged in in you know that I I I left Instagram last year like I'm still really tempted sometimes to jump on board but um um <laughs> but yeah like I I also don't like I did start like a film Instagram once like you know to show my like film projects up but I um I like cancelled it straight away after a week. Just can't handle like I, I'm in a privileged position where I don't like you know need to interact as much. Um, whereas others, you know, I I really admire the fact that you know some that their lives are so connected into that space that they need you know the presence is really important. And everyone has has a space in in those areas. Like everyone has roles, and I'm really happy that. I can, other people can take those roles. Can I jump, make a comment, um, Kimberly? I, I think what you just said um, is really interesting about how uh, a, a kind of contemporary sense of privilege is to not need to be on social media. Um, and I think since we're talking about, uh, you know, digital economies and what it means online, you know, in an internet space um, to accumulate wealth or to disperse wealth in in certain ways i think that's a really interesting read and how we could probably think better about um our reliance on social media platforms and and things like that in order to promote our work because i think it's a bit of a a false promise often and maybe this um relates to what rebecca was saying earlier about how in one on one in one hand there's a, a a greater sense of visibility and empowerment in terms of having your work seen and um, being able to connect with people and show your work on your own terms that in some ways allows you to bypass the kind of gatekeepers of the institution and allows you to uh, kind of make your own uh, you know platform for your work and and those connections so in in that sense for art and culture it's completely exploded out. Um, the ways, the opportunities that we have as artists to be able to connect um, with audiences and, our, and share our ideas. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's a bit of a trap because we are also 
working for those social media companies. We are creating the content that they feed off and the way that we are allowed or enabled to produce or share those ideas is incredibly limited. It's incredibly superficial. It's very, it only allows for very surface level conversations. Um, and so what we end up doing is really just focusing on each other instead of the kind of issues that we might be trying to express through through these platforms that would be better, you know, maybe it's, it is better to, to present your work on TV or, or in a live space or in some kind of other self-organized space that, that is offline or, or doesn't rely on that as the channel, as the channel that you're making your work for um, under this kind of false promise of, of exposure and social capital. <laughs> Rosalind, you can just you can just like take my ideas and 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 present them for me. Thanks. <laughs> I definitely don't need to do that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that's so beautiful. Can I like grab quote that for <laughs> for some social media? Um, yeah, look, that's I think that's a beautiful segue in a way um, to uh, talking about some of the challenges that emerge. Um, really, <laughs> thank you for perfectly setting that up. Um, and actually, I just wanted to read something that um, struck me at uh, on your website, uh, Rosalind, when was it your website? I'd, like a page I found. Um, uh, and that is, um, you say, my work explores how these network systems infiltrate, co-opt and disrupt our ontologies, emotional transmissions and experiences of time, memory, death, desire, friendship, and other socially formed cognitions. Um, and I, I, I just love that. I love thinking about this in a really complex way because I think we sometimes we really just um, think about, you know, people simplify the attention economy, um, you know, and, and addiction and algorithms. But I think this is a really wonderful way of how it's actually um, inter emotional transmissions and our ontology. It just really struck me as wonderful. Do, can you talk us through a little bit of um, yeah. how you're perceiving that impact? Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose what I'm trying to convey in that kind of long-winded sentence is, um, is that my work is, is really trying to drill down on a really personal level as to what the impacts of the, of the digital architectures and the infrastructures that now frame our lives, um, so much of our lives, how they're changing the way that we feel, how they're changing the way that we experience time, how we experience each other um, emotionally and socially and politically and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, an example of an, of an artwork that I could give um, that I made a few couple of years ago now was a kind of experiment, a, almost a linguistic experiment um, with uh, a woman that I dated on Tinder for about six months. Um, and the project was that we, we read uh, our text messages, the text messages from our relationship to each other face to face, like after we'd broken up after the relationship had ended, we got together, um, somehow I convinced her to do this with me, but um, we got together and read our text messages to each other. It took about three hours and it was about 60,000 words long. Um, and over the course of that time, what happened was um, kind of really understanding the difference between how you communicate through a text message and what the impact of those words have when you say them to that person's face. And it was it was a really beautiful project. It wasn't um, it was inc incredibly excruciating actually, but um, it it had a really beautiful kind of re resolution, and it demonstrated I think that we miss so much of that emotional transmission when we're communicating online, and we kind of lose sight of the fact uh, or th of the people that we're talking to or communicating with in these um, amorphous kind of social spheres. So that was just like a very simple example, I think, of, of paying attention to language and to words um, and to the impacts that they have when we say them to each other. Don't try it at home. <laughs> I am I'm like emotionally shook a little bit right now. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's because uh, Rebecca at the beginning when we were in the green room um, kind of uh, told Patrick that his uh, sort of in digitally <laughs> Write up of um, of his love story it was super inspiring to her during lockdown number six. Um, Patrick, do you want to talk to us about emotional transmissions really briefly? <laughs> Can I put you on the spot? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it's it, um, 
it's one of those uh it's one of those things where um you know the internet and social media provided access in a way that we wouldn't have had access for especially what ha- what basically happened to summarize um is that uh i started talking to my partner um in the very first lockdown that we all had back in 2020 um which are weirdly I'm nostalgic for, which shows me that this has been going on for too long. Um, and, uh, and we started talking in Twitter DMs uh, because there was, um, there was a window of, of opportunity, which I think is something I think about a lot when I, when I think of digital spaces there. You know, it's really the only thing that we should give it credit for is, uh, is expansion of opportunities, but that also means the opportunities for terrible things to happen as well but also the opportunity for good things, which is uh, connecting with someone who ended up being an incredibly profound connection. Um, Cause we started talking over Twitter DMs uh, and that just kept going uh, and going and going and going. And then by um, July of 2020, we ha- took it off Twitter DMs and actually went on a Zoom date because once again, we were both locked down in separate cities, um, you know, so we're talking about like uh, the digital version of sort of Starcrossed in the sense that we were like a pe- digital pandemic version of Starcrossed in the sense that like we were literally forced to stay in our room. So that connection would have been literally as impossible from two different cities uh, and would have been as equally impossible from two different suburbs, you know, to not uh, in, in the same cities to do uh, in um, uh during lockdown so um and then and then we dated over zoom for um uh for months and months and months and months and then we only met in person for the very first time in uh november um and now we are living together um and uh, <laughs> which is which is lovely and it's all going wonderfully and um and i think that uh i wrote about that for the guardian one because it was you know I love to share um, and uh, um, and I love to write, but also because I think that there is uh, there is value in in uh, looking at how connections are made these days, especially when like uh, we can kind of look at the value of them specifically in things like pandemic lockdowns. Okay, that's and right off the back of that. <laughs> I'll just segue with you because I think that's so you are in a way like putting the most vulnerable pieces of you out there. Um, And and I'm just wondering, have you encountered a lot of like negative feedback or has there, are there like darker parts of the internet that you struggle with? Because so far, so far you are just sound like you're having a great time online all the time. (laughs) just sort of skipping through this brightly lit meadow, um, you know, having jobs handed to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, no, look, the internet uh, can and is and, and, uh, and sometimes mostly is a hellhole. Um, uh, I often, um, I, I remember um, at, when I worked at Junkie, we would often um, talk about like, all the different times we were like cancelled over the year, uh, you know, and we use that in a very sort of ironic term um, because what we actually meant was when uh, various groups on the internet would take objection to something we wrote or something we said and then essentially harass and bully and try to dox us. Um, when I wrote uh, an article criticising um criticizing Chris Lilly's use of blackface in uh, like on a Netflix show. Um, and then uh, it was, and then his, uh, any of his shows with blackface were removed from Netflix. I had like the most obscene, and I've had a lot of internet, uh, like online harassment, but that was maybe one of the most obscene ones and one of the most scary because it was like, incredibly homophobic uh in in how it was based it was rape threats it was uh you know um very graphic um depictions of violence both um through words but also and and um and uh and threats 
but also in the in like things that were being sent to me over every every platform that you could think of i had people sending me photos of my house you know like um saying that they're going to come in and get me like it was and that was that was my job you know like that was not a particularly that was not even a particularly big day for me when i wrote that article that was like that was a oh yeah cool i write cultural criticism that's that's what you know and it wasn't even a big article either. It was a 300 word, uh, you know, so yeah, there's, there's that. Um, I've had, uh, I mean, only, only this year I had um, a whole bunch of um, uh, transphobes uh, petition to get me fired from my, uh, from my job and put together like a letter writing campaign that went all the way to like the CEO of the head company of my former uh, publication that I worked at, um, just trying to get trying to get me fired because of um, uh, my pro trans uh, views um, in my articles and online, um, which you know luckily didn't work. Um, and then and then it sort of continued to happen when I left that place as well. So it was like, you know, you might as well give up <laughs> um, but uh yeah so there is there is a uh, capacity for um there is an opportunity for communities to come together to uh commit really uh very negative um and unprecedented levels of harassment and abuse um and uh and we'd see that as a regular thing um you know like uh junkie recently instituted a um uh a uh, kind of um a rule where when they wrote about uh anything to do with stan culture um er, uh, the journalists would write it under an anonymous byline because we were so used to getting uh you know to writing let's say a four star review of you know of a pop stars um album and then one of our journalists would then get like uh, doxxed by hundreds and thousands of um, of people online, and you know, and cause massive, massive, massive um, like concrete issues, but then also uh, just the mental health issues of it all. And that was a really difficult thing to uh, to try to um, engage with online. It was very difficult. Like I, I really very. Um, I think that was a really great uh, initiative of um, of my boss to come up with that because it was at least something to do. Like often, often I would get like a, a freelance writer pitched to me being like, "Hey, I want to write about like you know the, uh, how problematic the depiction of women in Star Wars is," and I'd be like, "You are absolutely welcome to do that, but I've got to let you know I'm very limited as the editor of this publication in what I can do to protect you from what's going to be a horrific." torrent of abuse that's coming towards you you know like i can if it does become really bad i can get your name taken off it i can you know like and i can offer you sort of like amendments if you want but what else can i do you know and that's and that powerlessness in the face of just very very real and very very threatening abuse from online communities is one of the immediate uh <laughs> bad things that i can think about there's probably more. There's definitely more. That is, I have so, so many notes, so many things I want to come back to. Um, that is, I mean, it's fascinating that you as an editor have to be like to a new writer. And I, I wonder how this like plays in with sometimes new writers because we, so the last event we did as a part of this series, um, we talked a lot about content uh, moderation and how a lot of, um, uh, for instance, uh, fat or black activists get, disproportionately disadvantaged they get targeted with a lot more hate mail too mm. that came across um but i'm just wondering like is some of that um dissuading like a newer generation of people or smaller cre I, I mean kimberly at one point you did say like keep you know don't look at me <laughs> don't follow me on twitter is is there a sort of fear that like fear and loathing is there a sort of fear that this like uh, loathing environment like this this real like pylon environment is creating in in creating in creators great job lucy yeah is 
because that's something that happens and something that needs to be more proactively addressed. And to anyone? To, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't think um, people are fearing it. Like I like the example I was sharing earlier is just a personal, you know, <laughs> personal thing. I think people like are really like ready for the challenge. Like I like I think a lot of young people coming through are actually like they're aware of it. They're living through this digital age. Um, they've grown up with it. They don't know anything else. So I think they've like they're ready, and they're also pretty fierce and staunch. Like especially in the like blackfella community online, like they are ready to you know call the shots and I think that's really cool and there was a really great thanks for that there was a really great question in the chat that came up as well that just got sent through to me um and that is how do you guys view um the internet and the need for engagement um in impacting your work I'm very curious about that um actually from from all your perspectives and do you ever are you ever do you ever feel like you have to create um to be successful online rather than to create for artistic merit alone and i want to get each of your scoops on this um but maybe rosalyn we can start off with you to give um the others a break yeah there's a couple of things i I've kind of gone in in waves of feeling that pressure to be um, a consistent prosumer. Um, I use the term ironically, but yes, it, I think it definitely um, you feel like uh, you need to be posting stuff about your work so that um, curators are seeing it, so that other um, producers and, and audiences are seeing your works, so that leads hopefully to opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, and that has happened. That is actually a real way that we interact um, culturally now uh, for better and for worse. In some of my, the own, my cultural organising that I've done, um, I used to run an organisation called Electro Fringe, which is all about tech art, and I did a lot of my research online and searching websites and Instagrams and making connections around the world you know that was a curator that is a curatorial practice now um but i think it it there is a danger in that becoming a stand-in for actually building genuine relationships and conversations with the artists that you want to work with i think that's kind of one aspect of it um but the other one that i think hasn't really been touched on yet is about the fact that artist labor has been unregulated since the beginning of time and the internet you know, any kind of erosion of rights online is just an erosion of civil rights. It's just an extension of of um, of a lack of of kind of just systems that we have. Um, you know, I think that that distinction should be made blurry. But um, when we talk about digital economies, we're talking about capitalist economies. We're talking about the way that we exist in the world as well, and it's just a kind of extension um of of the real of this the the political systems that we have in place so artists labor is getting exploited online absolutely and it's these companies like like instagram that do some of the best jobs of that um but i don't think and i think those those companies should be accountable to that but i also think it's a bigger systemic problem um that comes from really shoddy uh concepts of of ownership and value um, that we have held right through our kind of colonial histories. So I think those two, that those would be my two, the two parts of my response. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, so much, to, so much to think about. And, and that is a lot of like the work that, um, you know, me and the team at Digital Rights Watch, like think about is so much of this is dictated by just the underlying socio-political and like socioeconomic structures, um, the sort of cult, you know, the, the structure of colonization that and, and over policing and and all those things are, uh, I, I think there's a real tendency to keep trying to solve things within like the little nook of the internet <laughs> in like technology, but really they're like system, they're just bubbling up um, through these systemic issues. Um, yeah, I, I find that really fun. No, thank you for that. I find that really fascinating. Um, I do wonder, um, to, before we 
because there's so much that you touched on that I want to jump into, but I do just want to pull it back to that question, the creating for engagement versus creating for the sake of creating. How do you guys see that? And I want to throw it to Kimberly and Patrick. So. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks, Rosalind, for making those amazing points as well. Uh, like, I think it's also such a good reminder as well, um, you know, we're, as creators, um, you know, the, 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 the things we put out there are in the hands of the audiences and how they respond and how they engage with it. And that's something that I've really grappled with in my work as a filmmaker, like, um, over the years, you know, what is a film going to do? Um, who am I making it for? And why am I making it? How, you know, all of those questions. And often the problem is that we have to make for, like, especially for broadcasters, big broadcasters in our country, um, we have to make for white audiences. And as like a really proud um, Yaru Bari and Gija woman, I'm always like really struggling with the fact that I have to create and a lot of my um, work is for, you know, those those audiences um, because there is that white, you know, there is that um, the, you know, it's it's all the, the bureaucracy of those organisations that hold all of those powers that um, you know, can tell us what their audiences look like and what we need to cater for. And sometimes, you know, it's also often, you know, the fact that you can make you can make things you can make things like films that you think are going to, you know, spark conversations or create change. And people may think that they can do that and just watch a film and sit back and get back to their regular life. And that's the danger, you know, of um, of creating. I think is like, as creators, I think we all grapple with that because we want to be a part of enacting some sort of change, whether that's like, you know, on a bigger level or just for our community. Like, I often think like my biggest dreams as a filmmaker is to return home and to just make films with with my community for my community like at the end of the, the day that's what I'm aiming for and there are people that do that then they might like you know I see them online or hear stories you know from conversations and um, I really yeah I really admire that because it's it's about preservation of culture of continuing you know language and story and all of that makes me really excited and I'm I live in big cities like Nam in Melbourne or I've lived in Perth and I use those opportunities to yeah to build on my skills so that I can go back home one day but I I do also have to say that this conversation is reminding me of um Michaela Cole's Emmy speech <laughs> Which, if anyone heard it, I've got it. I've got it here, and I'll I'll just read it out because it's. I think it was really amazing, and I was like, is "She talking to me?" Um, in a world that entices us to browse through the lives of others to help us better determine how we feel about ourselves, and to in turn feel the need to be constantly visible. For visibility these days seems to somehow equate to success. Do not be afraid to disappear from it, from us for a while and see what comes to you in the silence. Damn. Um, sorry, Rosalyn, you unmuted. Did you want to say something? No, I was just I... going to say thanks so much for reading that out. I think, thank you. We're really um, going through an emotional roller coaster during this panel that I didn't quite expect. That's all right. It's been a long couple of years for those of us who, who do live in um, or have lived in Melbourne. Um, okay, I I have so many questions stemming from what Rosalind and Kimberly just said, but Patrick, I just want to get to you with that engagement and creating for creativity's sake versus engagement's sake before I move into anything else. Um, I was looking at a, um, I, I don't keep a diary, but I keep 
lots of notebooks with um, filled with pro and con lists, um, which is maybe one of the most Virgo things I've ever said. Um, and I was looking back to uh, my pro and con list from when I uh, was quitting my job in publishing to become a freelance journalist. Um, and the first pro on that list was um, <laughs> get, a, uh, get an online profile so you can get your book deal. And I was like, what, like, what the, what, what was I talking about then? And it's sometimes easy for me to forget this, but I'm a short story writer, which is kind of like being someone who's like ruthlessly still doing bronze. Um, and it's in the eye and like everyone else has moved to the iron age. And I'm just like over here with my cop, like my bronze and copper daggers, just being like, I'm fine with this. <laughs> it's, it's the rest of you who are making a mistake. Short story writing is so anachronistic and stupid and there's no measure of success. But for some reason, I've decided that that's what I'm going to do as an artist. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on. It's all I've ever wanted to do. It's what I studied at university. It's what I've been going towards. And something like seven years ago, I realized because I was sitting in pitch meetings and seeing who was getting published in uh, by the major publishers in Australia and everything, uh, and I was seeing that the people who were getting stupid books of short stories or like I also write essays, you know, about comedy essays. Um, and I was like, who's getting published in Australia? Um, who's getting published with the books that I want to write in Australia? And I was like, oh, for some reason, it's journalists with like with large online platforms or um, uh, stand up comedians who host radio shows. Um, it's not... It's not actually people who are, you know, like plugging away at uh, at writing short stories. I will say that that is an outdated perspective. There's been a little bit of a short story boom, especially in Australia since then. There's like some amazing authors who are writing, um, some amazing Australian authors who are writing short story collections, but it's still a, uh, it is still not a, a commercially viable choice for a publishing house. So... I realized with the with the horrible um, uh, sort of hustle part of my brain that I needed to have uh, something else to offer publishing houses than like just the fact that I am, uh, you know, not to talk myself up here, but like a good writer of short stories, that's just not enough. So I had to have something else. And I decided that the best way to do that would be to then, then become a digital uh, culture writer for journalism and then get like a, a you know a bigger online platform which has now worked and you know get my writing in one form or another in the eyes of other people it still hasn't paid off yet I'm still not signed to like a you know a major publishing house I don't have an agent or anything but like you know the logic is there and it's and it was worth remembering that basically I you know essentially made that made that connection of like, how do I, how do I write for engagement? And how do I write as an artist and, you know, and somehow connect those two and make capitalism work for me uh, or, you know, play within that game without, uh, without losing myself in the process, which, you know, is it possible? I don't know. Rosalind just shook her head. Nope. <laughs> I, I do, so stemming on from this question, um, I guess the, the question I want to ask is, I, I sometimes feel like it's so ruthlessly fast the way digital um, platforms move. And Patrick, I jotted that down, like when you were first speaking, because I, I also have to monitor Twitter and, and you know, sort of be a part of the constant 24 hour, seven day week zeitgeist that happens in the news cycles with my work. Um, but I'm wondering how you guys perceive like your work as artists in sort of being in this insatiable, I would almost say culture of constantly having to produce more content. Like I feel like there's real pressure on artists to constantly be reinventing and constantly serving up new things. And I think Instagram and other places really incentivize um, that, you know, like if you're not posting regularly, suddenly you fall down to the bottom. Um, if you're not engaging at the way they want you to engage, you suddenly fall to the bottom. And I love Kimberly, that segment that you read to us, like that's so I, I want that to be 
true, but I think people are so often punished for stepping back and taking that silence and time for themselves. Um, and I guess last, before I throw it to you guys for your thoughts on this, but I'm reminded of, um, I, I, I recently watched Bo Burnham's um, Inside, which if you're in lockdown and you haven't watched it, don't just don't put yourself through the emotional suffering that is that. But one of the pieces focuses on how art is always in the background. Like it's um, it's not, you don't engage with, and, and Ross, and this goes back to your point of, of and, and Kimberly as well, you guys have both touched on this, um, that engagement with audiences. Is it the same in digital platforms or do people con in, like view it as a quick fix for entertainment, as a quick fix for a background noise, as a quick fix to a background of their everyday versus actually engaging with the art in the way they would in a more traditional format? Is, um, I can jump in for a tick. Um, I, I've, I think culturally we have moved into a space where people are, I see this all the time and, and I do it sometimes myself, you, you kind of create with the platform in mind, which I think is quite dangerous in, in some respects um, in terms of allowing your um, like the play area of your brain to travel in whichever direction it it needs to travel to make good work. Um, I think there can be a really narrow a real narrowing of the field um, when you're thinking about your work in terms of its social media presence, and that I, I think is really damaging. When we're seeing a lot of really um, we're seeing a lot of work become quite homogenous, and and the stuff that rises to the top is is a particular kind of work um, with a particular kind of face attached to it. Um, so I, you know, yes, I think that's definitely um, definitely an issue with with social media. Um, I had another point, but I've forgotten, <laughs> so I'm gonna throw it back. <laughs> we can come back to it for sure. I, I I always think if you, if you, if it occurs to you, just let me know in the chat. I, I often think about that, like when I post content as um and. It just goes back to sort of a lot of content is created for white audiences because that is just the dominant um, culture stream. And I some sometimes I examine it. I you know even when I fly, there's like Hollywood and then all of these like regionalized <clears throat> sort of films and content that's created. And I when I want to click Hollywood, I think like why? Like I've lived in so many places. Um, I grew up in the Middle East. Like why am I so? drawn to what's comfortable for me. And I constantly re-examine that. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, Kimberly, Patrick, did you guys have, or Rosalind, did the thought occur to you before I moved to, no. <laughs> did you guys have thoughts on like the content of being background? And I guess, Kimberly, have you thought about that as well um, with TV specifically? I think people just tend to sort of have it on um, and zone it out. Rosalind, I see your excited face. You've remembered the point. Sorry, I did remember it. Um, just very quickly, uh, I think the flip side of that is, um, and, a, and a lot of the really incredible work I've seen on, online is is work that is created for online environments and, and that is built specifically for interaction or platforming online. So we've seen a lot of it happen um, with the advent of, of the pandemic, of course, everything has shifted online. And I think for me, what has resonated as good work um, has been stuff that has been specifically tailored. It may critique the platform or the kind of social uh, situation that it's enmeshed within, or it may uh, use the particular facilities that a, a platform um, offers um, in really playful ways, in ways that push those kind of pedestrian uh, you know, technologies that we all think we know how to use, but can you know that the job of the artist often is to help us rethink um, our context and the way that we're situated um, socially and politically. So I think good good work for me and work um, that is warranted um, for being created online is work that really does engage specifically with um, with the platforms that it's using, um, as opposed to perhaps uh, uploading a painting that would maybe be better um, viewed in a room or uh, a, a theatre performance better viewed on a stage. Um, if nothing has been kind of adapted in a critical or intelligent way, I think that's that's when it, it you know, it, it's not interesting to me. And I think, but I think we also feel like we have to post it um, just to prove that we're we're doing something um, artistic and and to revalidate our uh, our identities as artists. 
but I take my hat off to you, Kimberly, for having stepped out of the hamster wheel of that. <laughs> Who knows? I might be back on. Um, I was just going to say I've worked. I'm working on a project at the moment that's um, been is is an independent project outside of any sort of attached um, broadcasters or anything. Um, and it, it's specifically going to be made for social media, but and it's tackling some pretty um, big issues in um like you know it, it talks it's it's human centered stories about First Nations people's interaction with like the criminal justice system, um, and yeah, and it's it's been an interesting project project to work on because because we are tailoring the stories to a short form content, but the stories are so big and complex that we've understood, we've really understood that it can't just be for, you know, a short film, um, two to three minute, um, you know, viewing on like your phone. So we've thought about other ways that, you know, and um, that the story can be told and can be told in a, um, in a more sort of, I, I suppose also for the person who's sharing that story, for them to feel that their story has been honoured in its full, um, you know, honest, yeah, in, it, in its truth. So we've, we've looking, we're looking at how, like, we can work with podcasts and how we can work with other sort of platforms to to tell the story and to, like, really amplify it and to, and to um, yeah, to give it all it, all it is which which has always been you know something for me as well often you know i i work often in documentary so i haven't really i haven't crossed over in, into the narrative world just yet because that's like also another crazy um beast but i really want to <laughs> but not just yet and yeah in the doco world you're telling your your like the responsibility is with other people's stories constantly so my my biggest like you know um if you haven't um, noticed, like I'm also a cancer, so I'm quite a sensitive little um, <laughs> little crab. But yeah, I've, I I really want to honor honor you know the the people's stories and tell it. You know, like at the end of the day, it's it's um, that's the responsibility as a filmmaker. And and I feel yeah, I find it really exciting to be able to explore these other parts of how we can. Um, you know, cross those platforms and, um, you know, along 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 the side of an impact um, campaign to, um, yeah, to the intersection of activism and, like, that's been so huge in our communities, you know, in the past, in the past year with that, you know, the amplification of the Black Lives Matter movement here in Australia and overseas and I think, yeah, I think... People are responding and and wanting more, but then it's it's how do we get them to the next step of um, engaging with content and then um, yeah doing things that are you know in their communities that are going to contribute in a positive way, not just tick the box of watching. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> gosh, I love that. Um... I really didn't expect just how um, I should have known because this is about creators. Anyway, I should have known what an emotional roller coaster this was going to be. Um, I'm conscious that it's just about 8 p.m. So to everyone on the live stream with us, um, sorry, we're going to run five to 10 minutes over um, just to wrap this because we did start really late and I want to give I feel like I'm cutting the conversation just as it's getting into its juiciest bits and I hate that. <laughs> Um, and that's part of my frustration with um, uh, with doing things in the digital space like this an event. It's just it would be a lot cozier if we could uh, break away and, and have some chats over wine um, in person. Alas, one day. Um, in wrapping, um, so that we can let everyone go and have what I assume is a late dinner, um, I just want to go through and have each of you kind of leave us with some takeaways um, based on what you said. And I guess, Patrick, maybe I'll start with you, but are there days when you want to burn down the internet and start over? And in those days, what would you do differently or what would you like to see done differently now? 
I mean, I call that a Monday. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I uh, I got to say that um, the last uh, the last couple of years have been really have been really difficult uh, for me in the sense that um, like I felt a bit of uh, a bit I felt a lot of responsibility for the type of um, news and like and creative coverage that junkie did um you know when i was the editor uh and uh and obviously we i won't go into the whole bargaining code uh sort of situation too much but sort of going back to what rebecca was talking about at the very beginning facebook's impact on our ability to deliver quality journalism as well as the type of writing and um and creativity that i value you know like i think a lot of i think a lot is focused on the on the journalism we do but you know we also write cultural criticism and also whatever the kind of like fun you know time wasty sort of stuff which is a, a sort of it's a creative uh, art form in itself and i value that the you know the uh what type of stuff that we do and Facebook's impact on our ability to deliver that uh, and to deliver the stuff that we're proud of cannot be overestimated. Like we know that Facebook has done terrible things to journalism, to, you know, like our ability to have a democracy. It's ruined the, you know, like uh, the digital media space several times before the, before the bargaining, uh, code even came about like that whole pivot to video thing, which we know was just them being like, look, we lied that lost jobs, many, 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 many jobs, you know? Um, and it was always a great part of my job when I would find, oh, cause you know, I won't say stats because I accidentally guessed a stat and then the guardian, uh, reported on it and I got in a lot of trouble, even though I don't work for that company anymore. I'm still scared about this, but a lot of our um, audience at Junkie were Facebook, uh, were from Facebook, like a very high proportion. That's all I'll say. I won't even guess a number. Um, and uh, which meant that we were, that we had to, in order to exist within the, you know, within the world of capitalism, because we needed a certain amount of views on our, um, uh, on our articles, uh, on our journalism in order to, you know, get the clicks for the ads for the people who pay us and blah, 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 the whole horrible Sisyphean wheel that we're stuck on. Um, when we could create good journalism and good reporting and good writing and funny creative stuff that fit with fit well within a social media, um, sort of world and worked with like, you know, with our readers and how they want to read it. And if Facebook was one of them, then great. But if, you know, if it was through newsletter and stuff like, or, or like through Instagram, a lot of great Instagram journalism is happening, a lot of terrible Instagram journalism is happening. But like when you could make that work, then that was a joy and that was a pleasure. And that was part of like what I liked about my job. But more and more, it felt like instead of giving any opportunity, Facebook was sort of like instead of having okay this is i'm, I'm gonna labor a metaphor because i love laboring a metaphor but if journalism is a beautiful free-range pig um like roaming the countryside and you know and and we believe that it's doing and like that it's it needs to be there and it's doing its job in the ecosystem of whatever our democracy is then facebook was doing the teacup pig thing you know it was it was constricting um, it was constricting it and forcing it to grow in a smaller and uh, and more limited way. And we had to keep adapting to them. And it was making our journalism always worse or at least making us force, making us choose between what was working on this, their platform and what we valued, you know. And so sometimes I would have to say we cannot run this very important report because we need the numbers, so we need to do this lesser valued thing. Sometimes there is value in like the lesser valued things, but you know, but the fact is we were always forced. And, uh, and so that 
So that whole um, being beholden to the platform, the platform running us rather than, you know, us just using a platform, that is what makes me want to, you know, burn the burn the place down and also what made me, you know, in the end, basically stress quit <laughs> um, that job. Yeah, that's that's fair. At some point, I thought maybe maybe I'll tell Patrick to wrap his thoughts so we can release people. But I thought, no, go off. <laughs> this is, I feel this. Um, and I think a lot of people share the frustrations. We've decided not to use Facebook anymore at Digital Rights Watch just because I'm really done um, trying to argue with their policy team. It's always in bad faith and I've never had good outcomes. And Lord knows I've sat in many meetings across the world with them. Um, uh, Kimberly um, and Rosalyn, you know, what I, I guess I put a different emphasis on the things that I wanted you to talk about in closing, but what, what are the things that you would want the digital infrastructure to change? And I think um, specifically Kimberly for you, the um, perspective of first nation storytellers and how they are represented. And um, I, I guess I go back to the sort of um, we create for a white audience. A lot of the times, is there something that can, um, that can be rebalanced and something that you would want digital platforms to do better? Let's just end on a um, big question, uh, just to wrap it up. <laughs> um, I would say, like, ownership of story is just so important. In and, like, yeah, I don't know. That's 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 my main. Yeah, I think push for ownership of story and. And opportunities to just create for the sake of creating. Like, um, there's a there's beautiful people in communities that are doing this already, and across Australia. And often we don't, we may not know about them because, like, they are just doing it. And like, there's a beautiful film collective up in the Northern Territory, uh, Karabing and Film Collective, and they they're just out there picking up using their iPhones. Um, or whatever equipment is available and creating stories for their communities. And often they're like very abstract, very conceptual, like really cool. Um, and it's also sort of gives me that attitude of like, like we're, we're doing it for us and not you guys. So if you don't understand, it's your problem, not ours. You can watch our films if you want, but we love them. And I, yeah, I just think that that's really cool and something that I yeah also want to aspire to. Yeah, and I just yeah I just think that there's just I think I'd love for more opportunities to just be obviously with one another like um, despite lockdowns and uh, the shitty times we're in. A lot has come from being able to jump in a Zoom room with like people from all over the country, which I've had good opportunities to do um, in the, you know, across the year and how many years we're we in, two years of, of yeah, living in this virtual world. And like, I am like, yeah, it's, I've, I've found myself in some really awesome rooms with people, Zoom rooms. And I think like, I'm not sure whether that opportunity would have come if, you know, if we were out, um, maybe it would, maybe it won't. But yeah, I, I like, I really appreciate moments like that in, in these times and I think um, being with one another to to create it would be amazing and and to own our stories would be um, even better. I love it. Yeah. Um, Rosalind, sorry, go on. No, I just said like completely agree. <laughs> um, I think my comments in that um, in answer to that question, really do et uh, echo Patrick and Kimberley's. I think the kind of prevailing sentiment is, you know, a desire to be creating on our terms. Um, you know, I think that that that's kind of what's come out of of both Patrick and Kimberley's comments, and that's that's the same for me as well. I think if uh, a, you know a request I would have or or something that would I, I would like to say is is an urge for more transparency. Um, you know, early internet days was kind of governed by coders and people who really knew what they were building. And there is this kind of, there's this anecdote from 
1993, AOL, uh, made this the kind of first deal where they released email as this as a, an add-on to telephone packages in the United States. So all of a sudden um, in the United States, everyone who had an AOL account, phone account, just automatically got an email address. And it's kind of said in internet culture that at that, that was the moment where the internet turned from this kind of uh, semi-utopian front for self-determinism and creating a, a new world order to um, that new world order being hidden behind the facade um, of a UX interface. And, and from that point on, we haven't really known how these things are built, how they're made, how they're kind of um, coercing us or controlling us, however softly or, or hardly that may be. But it's kind of just been in iteration from there. And I think that lack of transparency um, and that iterative change behind the scenes is where governments haven't been able to keep up both locally and internationally um, and where we have just become this kind of cog in the wheel um, without the agency that we wish that we had when we're creating and disseminating our work. Gosh, yeah, what a beautiful way to end. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That's beautiful and eloquent. Um, yeah, look, we, we have to end because we're 10 minutes over and I'm I realize that we started late, but I can't in good conscience ask people to sacrifice their entire night, even though I could have this conversation for the rest of the night. Um, a huge thank you to all of you for joining us, Rebecca, Rosalind, Kimberly, and Patrick. Um, if you're venueless, give us like a little, give, give us like hearts and thumbs up or claps or whatever's available there. Um, if you want more information about these wonderful um, people, you can go to digitalrightswatch.org.eu. In the events, um, there's like little bios and you can find all their work and everything they're up to. Um, and we will reconvene in a month or two for another conversation specifically about the music industry um, and how people create there. So feel free to join us. And yeah, just a big thank you for this emotional discussion. Thanks everybody for coming. And thanks um, for having us. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for it's been great. Thank you very much. Awesome. And Lily, you can take us off um, off live when you're ready.